Have you ever wanted to be a fly on the wall for a $300 million roofing company owner's keynote? Well, hey, we've got the speech for you. Uh, recently, Kurt Leanington of Linear Roofing was at Hook Agency with Reggie Brock, and he did a whole talk and shared how personal discipline and leadership and a number of other things will help you grow your roofing business. So tune in, watch this whole thing, take notes. I know I did, and I've been already using some stuff. It's powerful, and I appreciate you. Bye. The So please give your attention to Kurt, and uh, I do appreciate you being here and taking part in this. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Appreciate it. Oh, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, you know, someone lied. They like the highlight of the day is coming up. Like, that's already happened. Um, I'm not a speaker. I'm really just uh, someone that's in the roofing space that does what you do. And every now and then I get the opportunity to go around and just share what I do, things that work for me. Uh, I'll share some things with you today, but before we go into that, maybe as I'm talking or you know, I'd like to create some more collaboration because I can stand up here for 50 minutes. I think that's how long I got. And I can like, like shove down your throat everything that I think you want to hear. But maybe there's some things because I'm in the business doing what you're doing. Maybe there's some things that you're either struggling with, things you'd like to get better at, uh, things you'd like to share, or just my opinion on something. I'm happy to share it. Also know that I speak with a lot of certainty and sometimes that can come across as like, yeah, that guy thinks he's the shit and he knows everything. Um, I don't think that way, but I lead in certainty, so I speak in certainty. And how you do one thing is how you do everything. So, so please don't take that the wrong way. Um, a lot of people, when I go to places, uh, love what I say, but I never really connect with many people because I don't, I don't like, I, I'm not here to gain personal attention and I'm not here to build my audience. I'm not here to make money. I'm just here to try and give back based on what I've done, okay? So, you know, um, not trying to get famous, but you can go to my Instagram page. Uh, it's, um, it's Kurt Sting, K-I-R-T-S-T-I-N-G. If you, if, if you wanna take a look, it's a great page. I think I got just under 400,000 followers. And so, a uh, slight contradiction there. Um, so, so think about anything that you'd like to discuss and maybe write it down and, and we can chat through that. So a uh, little bit about myself. I'm from South Africa. Uh, I was born uh, and raised there. I went to, you know, I've used, I've used the example of 17 schools. Maybe it's 15. I don't know. I lost count. But I went to a ton of schools growing up and I grew up very poor. I'm sharing that with you because sometimes because I have an accent, people think I'm smarter than I actually am. And they're like, yeah, that guy was probably born with a silver spoon in his mouth. And, you know, no wonder he's doing so well. Well, I'm actually not that smart. Um, but I want to win. I know someone said they hate losing more than they love winning. Uh, I love to win. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Um, I do love to make money. I'm not going to sugarcoat that either. Because that creates options. That creates choices. Right? Um, and I love to help other people make money. I do every now and then travel the country and go to other roofing companies and help for free. Uh, my schedule's getting busier, so that's getting less and less, but I do that as part of the give back, right? Um, so 17 schools, South Africa, I came here in 1999, was $700 after the cost of my plane ticket. The exchange rate was about uh, 18 to one back then from the rand to the dollar. And um, I started as a personal trainer in an LA fitness, uh, working under the table for cash in a third party company that was handling the personal training in an LA fitness. At one point he didn't pay me and he said, what are you gonna do, report me? Um, Cause I wasn't legal. Um, when you came to the country back then, you could get a social security card. You had to get a social security number to get a driver's license. 
and you could actually go fill out the forms. They would send you a social security card to have your number on it, and then in a, in, a, in a circular motion, it said not valid for employment around the number. I went to Kinko's, I whited that out, I colored it back in, uh, and I went to work. Um, the cool thing is one hand doesn't talk to the other. As long as I still paid taxes, I reported, so even though I was paying taxes on a non valid working social security number, no one said anything. They saw social security number, they received the money, and they were okay. So when I finally became legal, I paid a thousand dollar fine because I, I did everything the right way. I did it wrong, but I did it right. Uh, a lot of contradictions today. Um, but, but anyway, so, so I started working at LA Fitness and I, I, uh, I stayed there 20 years. I went from personal trainer to executive vice president of sales. I was with them from around sub 100 locations to 820 locations. I moved all over the country. And really, I actually feel more comfortable at bigger scale, simply based on what I'm used to, than I do in the small scale. I get a little claustrophobic when it's too personal. I got personal issues from growing up. Um, and anyway, a uh, little growing up. My dad was a police officer. Um, my stepdad worked on the railways. We lived in a house on the side of the railways. At school, they used, I used to do ninjutsu. They used to call me the railway ninja at school. And so, you know, uh, we were so poor, most of the time there was no electricity. Um, I'd get my clothes from lost property at school and say it was mine, and that's how I got my stuff. And, and so, for me, coming to America, and, you know, a lot of people ask me, someone asked me the other day, they're like, are you going to stay in America or do you think you'll go to another country because everything's so messed up? And I said, you know, America's been great for me. I don't know about you. And maybe you're getting sucked into all that stuff and there's some real stuff happening out there, no doubt. But there is real stuff happening in all over the world. And I don't believe it's that different, truthfully, because let's be real. The only reason it feels different is because the speed of communication. Shady, people have been shady since, if you've read uh, Good to Great, uh, uh, sorry, not Good to Great, uh, 48 Laws of Power by Robert Greene, and you start reading some of the stories of history and war and all these things, you'll realize people have been shady since the beginning of time. Uh, it's just that it's communicated and captured and distributed much faster than ever, right? So people are exposed, but they've always been this way. Nothing's really changed. Government's always been shady. People have always been shady. Don't worry, there's some good folks out there too. Um, I'm sure everyone in this room is, is part of that. Um, so, about four years before um, I left LA Fitness, I met a guy who came from roofing, Neil Palmer, he was my partner. We decided to start this roofing company. I'm thinking I'd get about you know, three sales a month for the company. I'm thinking small at that point. A little extra money in my pocket, and bam, I'm gonna be great. We start this thing. He came from roofing, he'd been in roofing 15 years. I stayed at LA Fitness. We got the company to 16 million while I was part-time working at LA Fitness and finally decided that I need to go all in. I left at the end of 2018. So basically since 2019 to now, I've been in roofing full-time. If you have written down some questions that you wanna ask me and you wanna ask me anything about roofing, I don't know. I don't know much about roofing, but I do know people and I know how to build teams and how to work with teams right? And you'd be amazed how little I know about roofing. But that doesn't really matter because I got a lot of people that know a lot about roofing. And that's really what I'm good at is putting teams together. So a lot of people say, hey, Kurt, how did you grow? How did you get to these people? Personally, I think we're tiny. If you think in the grand scale of the world and conglomerates and massive organizations, 180 project managers is tiny. I think once you start getting over a thousand uh, you're probably pushing some good boundaries and you're pushing a good number. In our group, I think we're at 480. So we're probably at the halfway mark in our group. We have another three letters of intent out. So by the end of the year, we'll probably be at about nine companies and that may push us to six, 700, depending on uh, where that number lands. And that includes office and in the field. Uh, so growing and growing. I come from a belief that says there's no such thing as business problems, just personal problems that roll into the business. Which means it doesn't matter what you learn here today at all, unless you can fix you. 
every single thing that's happening in your business today is because of you. Because even if someone is doing bad things in your business and you're pointing the finger, it's because of you. Does anyone know why? Help me. You're also responsible. I know you're responsible and everyone says that because you're the owner. The, the buck starts and stops with you, right? Yeah, you Good. set the pace. You set the pace. Why else? And feel free to participate. They're a reflection. There's no such thing as wrong answers. They're a reflection of you. They are a reflection of you. Yourself yeah, they're a reflection of you, right? Uh, that's not really my answer, but you're right. You're either allowing it or... That's what I'm looking for. They know they could get away with it under your leadership. So it's still your fault. Even though you had nothing to do with it. Like you had nothing to do with it. Some way, somehow, this motherfucker thought that he could get away with that shit under your leadership. So the first thing I'm going to share with you today, well, it's probably the second or the tenth, um, is that you have to be a killer. Now, for the camera, not literally. <laughs> I don't want someone to go post something on social media with the thing of me saying, Kurt says you must be a killer. Uh, you, you need to be a killer. Why? Think about a pack of lions. How do they perceive the leader? The alpha. The alpha. Do they have to fight to be in that role? Yes. And what do they get to be in that role? The they sleep on higher ground. They eat first. They do all that stuff, right? I know Simon Sinek, his book says Leaders Eat Last. It's a great book if you haven't read it. Uh, Leaders Eat Last. Um, but, I, you know, I guess I share this with you because most people are like, I just don't know how you can keep growing like that. One, I have to be the example and I have to look inwards. You can't manage my checkbook until you can manage your own properly. You can't manage my people until you can manage yourself people. You can't manage customers until you can manage yourself in my office, I have a sofa, almost like a counselor's uh, uh, setup. Inevitably, every discussion with problems, I dig deep enough and I eventually find out that there's something personally going on. But to be this ultimate leader, your people have to know that the person steering the ship, if we went to war today, if we went to war today, do they look at you as the killer? as the person that will give the command on how to do it, where to do it, and will they run into battle with you? They will if you're a killer. See, people move across country to come work with us. They move their families. I take that very seriously, which means that the way that I operate the business is that everything counts. Nothing is neutral. Something that you do or happens in your business either takes you forward or it takes you backwards, but it's not neutral. In most cases, if you're operating from a neutral position, the negative just hasn't caught you yet. And when it does, it's too late. So when I think about being a killer, and I think about running the business, and I think about being this leader, and I think about how people look at you, I do not take the way that I run the business or discussions lightly ever. Everything counts. Nothing is neutral. And I mean from the minute you wake up in your personal life and your personal relationships to your business. Because you can't be one thing at home and another thing at work. Why? Because it's not real. It's a show. And when it's a show, it's contrived and people sniff you out. And time always tells the tale. Now you may say, gee, I didn't come here to listen to this guy tell me I gotta be a killer. Well, the killer instinct moves you further away from neutral things. Because everything is important and everything counts. You don't have to spend a gazillion hours with your family to be impactful. Most people sit around and watch TV too much and they think that's spending time with the family. It's pointless, it's dead space, it's not impactful. 
When you go on vacation, some people say to me, man, you go on lavish vacations. I'm saying, yeah, I save money, I book the vacations, and I make them dramatic, because I have to make them impactful. Otherwise, why am I doing it? I don't need a lot of time, I just need impactful time. You have newborns, kids, they don't even have an attention span past 10 minutes. They don't need a ton of time. They just need impactful time. When you're at home, you're focused and attentive to those around you. Your spouse, your girlfriend, your kids, whoever it is. Hell, even your dog. My wife even says it. She says, like, he comes home and guess what? First 20 minutes, he's on the floor with a freaking dog. <laughs> hey, you know what? I don't have kids. If I had a kid, I'd probably be with the kids first, right? I'm with a dog, 20 minutes. She's like, I've been replaced. Then I give her time. One thing you'll also see is I travel to shows and I travel to different things and I go to roofing conventions and I go to speaking events. Most of the time my wife actually goes with. I'm uh, heavily into the car world. All the car events my wife goes with. She's a part of what I do. Because another one for you is that everything is one. Work, home, Whatever it is, it's actually all one. Think about it. When I first met my wife, we went on vacation, and I woke up early, I was, we had a little pool in front of our own spot. I was in the pool, on my laptop, on the phone, and she's like, why do you have to work when we're on vacation? And I let it go, and I spoke to her later, and I said, let me ask you a question. If every time we go on vacation to places like this, this dramatic, this cool, this awesome, we've got our own private pool in front of our own cabana on the beach. But every day I wake up, I spend two hours working, making phone calls, and making sure that my business is operating. And then I give you the rest of the day. Would you be okay with that? She's like, absolutely. I said, great. Now, I still do that on every single vacation. I don't come from the mindset. Remember, everything counts, everything matters all the time. I actually am more effective and efficient on vacation than I am at work. I actually want you to take a lot of vacations. I actually tell my people to take a long weekend vacation every month. Why? Reset, not really. I don't even believe in the reset, truthfully. Because everything's one. I'm resetting all the time. I don't need to move away from my life to reset. Go ahead. Create memories, enjoy life. That's why you're here. You're not here to be a work slave. You only become a work slave if you're working a lot and you believe that things are separate. It's all right here. We've spoken about the brain today. It's all right here. Leadership and management is a neck up job. And if you guys are owners and leaders, it is, it is all just in, in the head, all of it. It's how you think about it that changes your actions. I think there was a series earlier about the different things that take place that lead you to your habits that eventually determine your outcome in life. So if we could just change the way we think about some simple things. You're sitting at a restaurant. It's rude for me to take a phone call. If it's important enough, and it's paying for that fabulous restaurant and dinner and the destination that you're at, then you take the darn call. So rewire how you think about this work-life balance bullshit. And the minute I have someone working for me and they give me that speech, like it just pisses me off. Like, don't give me that. Now I gotta go into this long explanation of how I gotta rewire your brain on how life works. Know this, when I said earlier, not everything I do and everything I say is set in stone. There are other ways to a destination. There's 10 ways to get somewhere. This is just my way. So please don't sit there saying that's bullshit. Because if there's a better way and it works for you, you keep doing that. I'm okay with it. Make sense? Okay. We, we started the roofing part-time, became full-time. 
let's put this into perspective. Uh, we're currently projecting about 32 million EBITDA this year. Okay. I'm not telling you that to brag. I'm telling you because what I'm sharing with you and what I do works. If you apply it all the time, not sometimes, not when you're working, all the time, home, life, no such thing as business problems, just personal problems that roll into the business. I promise you, in most cases, people don't have to fix the business. What do they got to fix? Yeah, and I know you've heard that, right? But hopefully I'm putting that in a better perspective for you. Because sometimes when we understand the why, now it's a little more like, okay, right? I, I truly grasp what he's getting at. Because we've all heard that, right? And at that point, it's, it's nothing special. So we started this thing, we grew, we joined private equity, we're acquiring companies. Our goal is to disrupt the way insurance currently works. And that's what we're working towards. Scale, geography, systems, process, um, quality of work, uh, changing lives. Um, so I'll share a couple of other things with you. Um, three Ps. There's three Ps, in my opinion, that hold people back in relationships and business. And the first one is permanent. And you want to write these down because you won't remember them. Anyone want to take a swing at why the belief of things being permanent hurts us? It's simple. Someone has a problem at work, someone has a problem at home, someone has a problem in a personal relationship. And what they do is they see the way that things are now and they forecast it forward. We're very good at doing that, right? We're really good at projecting, right? In business too. Let's take a look at the projections. But we also then carry that into our personal relationships and we project forward. And we see, we know this, if we go back one year, two years, five years, 10 years in our life, in our relationships and everything, we've probably all been in some very dark places where in that moment we thought the world was coming to an end and our life's never gonna be the same and here we are today. And the lesson there is that, that, that nothing, know this, the only thing permanent in this world is? Yeah. And? Yeah, and? Your soul. What? Your soul. <coughs> I know we all got the death and taxes down, but, <laughs> right? Uh, that's all that's permanent. Whatever it is, it's going to change. And whatever it is, it's going to change for the better or the worse. And you control that 100%, right? So I want you to start thinking about this Here's my application. As you run in the business and shit's going wrong, as you're in a relationship and shit's going wrong, and you're going through it and you're in the heat of the moment of it, I want you to take a deep breath and tell yourself, this will not be permanent. This is not how this will be a week from now, two weeks from now, a month from now, three years from now. There's no need to exit the relationship because of what's happening right now. Why is this, uh, these three things so valuable for you that I'm sharing with you? Is because in some ways, and I'm gonna get to vision casting, but in some ways, you have to coach your people through some of these things. Because in most cases, you guys may be good at this, but you haven't been able to articulate this mindset with your people well enough. And you could do it by going back to your next meeting and adding value and giving them something different than when, what they're normally used to hearing. It's the other problem with meetings, and it's the reason people don't want to go. They're like, we could have done that over the phone. I didn't learn anything. I just sit through that shit. What a waste of my time and my gas, right? So you have to keep reinventing yourself when you talk to your people. So first one is permanent. Next one is pervasive. Anyone know what pervasive means? Sorry? Yeah, so one, we think things are permanent and these are very closely tied to each other. The other thing is, that specific situation, right? Uh, they, they think that now because there's one thing wrong in the relationship, there's that one section, my commission's always wrong, or you keep doing that, honey, or there's just that one little segment in a relationship that's not working out, and guess what we do? We now say the whole relationship is problematic. I went out of this. This is bullshit. I don't want to have to deal with this anymore. 
this relationship sucks because of that one thing. People are very good at this. Something happens at home in a relationship and all of a sudden something happens and now all of a sudden everything's bad. Okay, let, let's sit down and, and write the pros and cons and do a Benjamin Franklin close quickly on a piece of paper. Yeah, quickly. Let's, let's put the pros and let's put the cons. I guarantee you we got four more pros than cons. So how is it that this one thing is ruining the entire relationship? You've got to think about this too. Because have you made these mistakes with some of your leaders? And is it influencing the way that you lead your people because you are falling into the same trap? You got that one thing about a guy and you're willing to ruin a relationship over it instead of figuring out how to fix it. Remember, everything I say is about people, leadership, and development. Everything you're thinking about is how to improve dealing with people and understanding people. But the first thing you have to do, uh, there's a book out there by David Kiersey called uh, Please Understand Me. And it's a book that if you read it, it teaches you how to understand yourself first because you can't understand how you're dealing with people and how they're treating you unless you have a true grasp of who you are first. So getting to know you will help you much better at getting to know other people. Make sense? Because perception is reality. And if you're working from a perception perspective to get an understanding, you're losing because it's not real. What was the name of that book again? Please Understand Me by David Kiersey. And then the last P is personal. Man, we take things personally, don't we? And we got to remember that it's not just about us. It's not just about you. Um, you have to, if you've, I'll give you a ton of books today. Um, if you've read The Four Agreements by Don Miguel Ruiz, uh, it's a phenomenal book. And as a matter of fact, if you were to download The Four Agreements, just listen to the, four agree the actual Four Agreements. Some of the Toltec stuff and all that stuff gets a little wacky, but um, the Four Agreements, one of them is stop taking things personally. And he articulates in that audio and relates it to real life experiences about taking things personally. And the minute it becomes personal, what do we do? Whether it's us or the other person or the other people or the other business, the minute anything becomes personal, what happens? Yeah, it's an emotional response. And if you don't have control of your emotions, you're screwed. Now you may be sitting here and you're just saying, man, he's telling me all this stuff and I sort of get all this stuff and like I just haven't really learned anything yet. Okay. But if I had a camera follow you over the next 30 days and we went to the playback film and we looked at every situation you dealt with, how well are you doing what I'm telling you today? And that's a self-assessment and a self-evaluation on how that's working for you. What's the measuring stick? <clears throat> Are you growing? Is your team growing? Is the business becoming more effective? Is the business becoming more efficient? I'll give you a quick example. Last year we were 23% net. This year we're trailing 28. Because I'm always seeking improvement. I'm always looking for ways to improve the business. I'm looking for the... Uh, I'm looking for ways to improve all the time. I was thinking of a book in my head and I can't think of it right now. Um, people want the most amount of pleasure. It's called Pleasure Trap. Another great read for you. Uh, anyone who actually has a substance or an addiction problem in your business, uh, get them to read this book. It's called The Pleasure Trap. Um, and the book really goes to show that uh, people want the most amount of pleasure with a path of least resistance. That's what we want. We inherently wired that way. It just is that way. And so people are always looking for this, right? The shortcuts. And you have to prevent yourself from making these because that's why you can't grow, right? Because your people get to know the real you over time. So when you stand up in front of people and you start having meetings and talking about shit and how you got to do it right and all the rest of it and your team in the back of their heads thinking to themselves, bullshit, I know what he's really thinking, bullshit, I've seen this guy when he's at the bars, bullshit. 
I've seen this guy with other women, bullshit. I've seen how he pulled commissions from other people, bullshit. Why'd you smack him? No, I'm just kidding. Um, so three, three P's, right? Uh, it's not permanent, pervasive, and stop taking it personally. Um, next one I'm gonna share with you is sort of like a, an example to a fist. Team of five, five people, a fist. If I were to take one finger out of this, and this is value-based. If I were to take one finger out of this um, and I were to punch you, would it, would it hurt? Two? They gotta work together, right? They gotta be one together to get the impact that you need, right? And when we look at value, right, um, we start thinking about five things in a business and to run the business effectively, right? And the first one is, so, when you become a leader in our team, we actually, this is part of our sort of like uh, culture, right? And the minute you become a leader and you've worked hard to get there, we say that you are now in the circle of safety, not the circle of trust. We call it the circle of safety. And what does that mean? I came from corporate America. And in most sales performance jobs, when people aren't performing, specifically leaders, what happens? People have discussions with you and what do they say? If you can't get the numbers up, you're out. So they threaten your job, right? And I was tired of it, because it happened to me over 20 years. Every time performance, it doesn't matter. I'd have performed for five years in a row. You get to year six and you're sucking, you're getting threatened. Either you're gonna get demoted or your job's gonna change. So we have a policy. When you're in the circle of safety, we will never talk about your job. And we will never talk about a demotion. Because we will not lead with threat management. We will not lead with negative consequences. A lot of companies too, they start growing, they start getting busy, and they can't get compliance from the sales team, so guess what they do? They start putting in penalties for not doing stuff right. Well, if you don't get this, this, and this, and this, and this and in, you'll lose 5% of your commission. And if you don't get it in by this date, you'll wait another month before you get paid. And if you don't do this, so now we start looking for negatives to manage the business. We don't do that at all. It's the worst thing you can do on earth. When you got people waking up, working hard, knocking doors, beating the streets, and now just because they're getting some shit wrong, they're going to get penalized? The quickest way to break down morale in your business. You've got to rather look inwards and say, how can we support this or put things in place to improve this so that it gets done? The other thing I could give you is stop trying to make salespeople operations people. Because they're not. Put the support around them for the things that they're not good at instead of trying to change them. It's like getting into a relationship with someone in the beginning and it's all cool and you love them and they love you because you're seeing past all the flaws in the beginning because you're working from a perspective of lust and all those kind of things. And so you don't see the shit, right? But then when that goes away and you start seeing the shit, now guess what people start trying to do? Oh, I don't want you doing this and I don't want you wearing that and I don't want you doing this and you can't go out with your friends here, you can't go out with your friends there, you need to do this, you need to do that. And guess what we're really doing? We're trying to change people, and that's not who they are. You can help your people change through your example and by putting things in place that nudge them slowly to their own benefit in order to help them grow. But instead, we're so good at laying down the law. We're so good at saying to people, here's how it's going to be. And we have these big meetings, and we're gonna change this now, and our AR is too high, so here's what we're gonna do. And people hate you for it, why? Another book out there, 13 Fatal Errors that Managers Make. Have you started reading it? Uh, not yet, I just- In the book, in the book it says, as a leader and as an owner, you are naturally guilty <laughs> by those that follow you. Because they think everything you do is self-serving. You have to prove them wrong through your leadership, through your guidance, through your actions. 
through the things that you do. And when you, when you do that right, they'll change their thinking. But instead, we try and force the change of thinking by the things we put in place. Hopefully you guys are going to remember all these books. Yeah, what book was that? Thir 13 Fatal Errors That Managers Make. It's a simple read, guys. It's a quick read. You can read it, read it on a frickin' plane flight. It's simple stuff. It's really the 13 errors that leaders make when they lead people. Like the first one. Anyone read it? Anyone remember the first one? Do you remember? Huh? No, 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 no. Uh, the first rule in the 13 Fatal Errors, if anyone's read it. But thanks for remembering. Refusing to take personal accountability. That's number one. Uh, another one, trying to control results instead of influencing thinking. We wake up every day and guess what we do? As owners and as leaders and as managers, what do we do? We wake up and we look at the numbers. And we're like, ah, fuck. Fuck. Fuck, it sucked yesterday. Right? Then you call up the leader and you call up the other guy, and then that guy calls the other guy, and now it's shit's rolling downhill, and everyone's pissed. Why? Because you're managing, trying to control results, right? Instead of influencing thinking. Right? And so we, we manage from results. And I want you to start managing through connectivity and spending time with your people. And you know, this whole, like, uh, as owners, you know, you hear this. You hear this from the field. Yeah, boss, when are you getting out there? I'm not. I was out there. That's how we got here. I, I don't need to prove that to you. That's not my role today. My role is to grow this business and work on and in some cases in the business. I'm a player coach at some point. And at some point, there's different stages to that where you move away from that and you truly are working on the outside to grow the business. And you have people, integrators and visionaries. You have integrators in your business and a visionary. And you're the visionary. And in the beginning, you're everything. And then as you grow and as you move through the stages, you move through these to where you essentially are the visionary. And you have a bunch of integrators. I have those. That's how I have walk away power for my business. I can go on a 30-day vacation, a 60-day vacation. That business still runs. I'm not hostage to it anymore. But it took a lot of work to get there. So. <clears throat> So I talk about the fist and I talk about the five things, right? And I talk about how we run the business and we talk about the circle of safety. I don't just talk about it, it's real. We have two other hashtags. One is, anyone know our hashtags? We're not the same. We're not the same and we do it better. Anyone want to know why we have that in our business? So you walk into our business, you walk into our office and there's a big thing on the wall that says we are not the same. Maybe. Any other ideas? So it's letting everyone know it's okay to be different. It's okay to be different. Inspires creativity. Inspires creativity. Walk that's the standard. Huh? That's the standard when you walk in the door. It's the standard. See, us human beings, we're like these touchy feely people. We're very needy. And that's why you need to be a killer, right? Because as the leader, people need to know that they're in the right place. People need to know that they're following the right people. And in some ways, let's think about uh, Tampa Bay, right? Uh, the Buccaneers. Uh, what's that quarterback's name? Tom Brady, Tom Brady that's it, right. And, uh, and so like this guy leaves one team and goes to a shitty team and all of a sudden they win. And they added like one or two players, but there was still a lot of existing players that were still there. So my, my question to you is, how did they win all of a sudden? Anyone know? Anyone thought about that? I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't just like he went in with some specific strategy that won the game. And he didn't win the game alone. So what changed? And I want you to think about this with regards to your business, because your business could be uh, uh, in different stages right now. You could be winning, you could have stuff catching up that you don't know is there, you could be slightly backwards, you could be having some morale issues, you could be totally winning and everything's great, everyone's in a different position and that's okay. You said something? Someone did, huh? 
Your habits? No. Who's read good to great? You know what the enemy of great is? Good. It's so easy in America to be good, man. I'm a foreigner. I know that. You can come in here and make okay money just being somewhat okay. And you can get by. Got some basic work ethic? You're going to be fine. Right? That's why most people never become great. But the book is actually that people want to be part of something greater than themselves. It's a known fact. There's some, there's some uh, examples in history, in negative movements in history, where people got the masses to do things that were not right because he made them feel like they were part of a movement, part of something great. Whether it was positive or negative, didn't matter. I mean, it matters, but it, in the example, it just shows you. Look at Hitler. Could be a controversial statement. But if you think about it, you can get the masses to do something for their own good. See, you can utilize it for the benefit of people's own good to create a culture where people fought, feel like they're part of something greater than themselves. They're very needy. Uh, in the book, they, they came up with like 15 or 20, I can't remember. Uh, they ranked the things that made good companies versus great companies, Walgreens, CVS, Walmart, all these things, good and great. And what were the, what were the difference makers? What were the things? Number one was, the great companies created a culture where people felt like they were part of something greater than themselves, a movement. If you don't have that in your company, remind me to come back to my hashtags in case I forget. If you can't do that, you're never going to become great. Because at some point in your business, it gets numb, it gets boring, and we're going to get into vision casting. So it gets numb, it gets boring. Money was number five. And side note, I go on a lot of those. Side note. Stop throwing money at problems in your business. Money solves nothing. If you've got a cultural problem, you can throw out bonuses, incentives, and contests, and all the rest of it. It will not fix the problem. It'll just put a Band-Aid on it for a short while, and while the Band-Aid is on it, that scab underneath is actually getting worse. Because it needs air to breathe. It needs air to heal. So you need to deal with it. It's got nothing to do with money, why these companies are great. Our theory is, and we get people, we're a non-licensed state in Texas, we get people trying to steal our people all the time. All the time. And my theory is, if you work with me, even if someone offers you more, you'll make more money with me. Because of our training, our development, our culture, our motivation, our support, we care for you, we're gonna help you, we're not fake, we're not in it just for ourselves, but we are in it for ourselves too. Everyone is. You're lying if you're not. We're all squirrels chasing a nut. That could go in many different directions. But so coming back to it, people have got to in your, in your business. And you're like, well, how do I do this? How do I do this? Fix yourself. Put other people before you. Invest in your people, spend time with your people, never get too far removed from the daily happenings of what's going on, um, and you'll start developing people to start doing the things that you do, right? Hashtags, Tom Brady. Those people on the team felt like they were now part of something great because the GOAT is on our team. And that mental state, that mental state got them to perform at a higher level without even changing the game plan or the skill set. And they won. When we say we're not the same, guess what people think when they start working with us? It's got nothing to do with, hey, we think we're better than everyone else. It's got nothing to do with that at all. It's about people feeling like they're part of a movement, part of something great, part of something that's going to change the industry. And the next one was, we do it better. We haven't changed it. You guys probably, I know you know way more than me, but I know that I can control basic fundamentals. 
And if I could get people to do basic fundamentals better than your folks, I'll get more referrals. My jobs will get done quicker. I'll probably have better cash because people will pay me. My business will stay in business a long time and keep growing because we just do it better. I did not come in to try and reinvent the business. I just wanted to take what everyone else was doing in a highly fragmented business and add systems, process, people development, training consistently and do it better. I've already given you everything you need to know to scale your business. Everything. So first one is communication in the five on the fist. We look each other in the eyes, right? Uh, and we always tell the truth. So if you're thinking, if you don't have core values in your business and you're thinking about some core values here, these are some things you could think about. And the thing about core values, I don't want to go down it too far because everyone's hit it and they've beat it up and it's like, you know, core values, it's overdone. And, but you probably still need to have them, but you need to live by them. See, the problem is most people do them, they put them up on the wall and then everyone looks at them, but everyone knows that you don't operate the business by them. Right? And so the first one is communication. You must specifically in your leadership team, you must know that you can look in any person's eyes and deal with the accountability and that we communicate and we always tell each other the truth no matter what. Trust. I trust you and I believe in you all the time, even when you fail. This is where we make the mistakes is because everyone makes mistakes and then they get the impression that we don't trust them anymore based on how we start treating them because they made a mistake. But if we're in the circle of safety and we're talking about the five things, trust is critical. Coach John Wooden says, without trust, you can't call yourself a team. You control this because firstly, everyone needs to trust you. And every time you step out of line where it puts a gray in the area of trust. And let me give you a quick example of some of the mistakes that happen. You decide to spend the day with one of your guys, right? And one of your other guys calls you and you take the phone call and you're in the car. What's the easy trap here? What's the mistake that we make and we don't realize how it's hurting trust? The guy did something stupid. You say something to him, you get off the, way, get, you get off the phone and what do you say? That stupid guy, like, he always does this shit. Like, I don't know why he does that shit. Well, guess what? If you're on the phone and I'm with you and you did that, the opposite happens. I don't know if I can trust you. See, we make the trust mistake all the time. Remember, everything counts. When you get to work and you walk down the corridor and someone walks past you, saying hello to them and engaging with them counts. There's no such thing. I hear it all the time. My boss is so busy I couldn't get a hold of him. Bullshit. No boss is too busy. And you should never be in a position as a person in a company to feel like you can't talk to your boss because they're too busy. That means that your boss has given you the impression that they're too busy and therefore you feel like you're bothering them if you're calling them. And that's actually a bad technique for bad leaders to get their phone to stop ringing. Always answer your phone and always be there for your people, always. What if it's nine o'clock at night and you're at a dinner and this guy that you got on your team, you know he's high maintenance and the phone's ringing. How do you handle that? I'm trying to give you live situations. How do you handle that? Hey Johnny. Uh, I'm at a really important dinner. I didn't want to miss your call because you're important to me. Uh, when I'm done with dinner, or can I call you first thing in the morning? Yes, sir. Thank you. I still answered. I didn't get sucked into the conversation. Right? Because I took control of it. 
but do not ignore your people. So we got communication, we got trust. Our trust in our business, specifically with leadership, is circle of safety. Uh, number three is care. People have got to know that they can take chances and they can be daring and they can go for stuff and go for it. I got you. I care about you. I got you. Take the chance. I'm going to back you all the way. If they don't believe that and they feel like they're always going to get into trouble, you got a problem. They're not going to grow. They're not going to take those leaps of faith because you don't care. You're just going to castrate them the minute things go wrong. That was a little aggressive, but. <laughs> Next one, number four, collective responsibility. What do I mean by that? Guess what? When we win, we celebrate together. When we lose, whose fault is it? It's all of us. We lose together. Collective responsibility. In sales teams, you get different personality types, like court jesters and sideline troublemakers and all these things. You get these guys that actually don't create trouble. It's in 13 Fatal Errors, by the way. Um, you get these, these sidelines troublemakers. They, they're always positive, smiling, and great, and everything, but they're always, when you're not around, giving little bits of information to other people, because they're getting other people to raise their hand and say shit. When people know that you care for them, and you can trust them, they can trust you, these things go away, right? Collective responsibility. And then lastly, pride. I make a big deal in our vision casting and in our quarterly meetings about wake, I'm not wearing it now, I didn't want to uh, bring it in yet, but wearing the logo, putting that shirt on. The pride to be part of this team, the responsibility that comes with being on this team, the accountability that comes with being on this team, and the expectations amongst each other that we all perform. Know this, what I'm telling you may sound perfect. It's not perfect to manage. It takes daily work. As business owners, you need to stop chasing destinations. As business owners, we put these things in our heads that like, I want 150 guys or I want to get my accounting to this, or if I could just get this to that, or whatever it is. And then when we get there, there's something else. And we get there, there's something else. And we get there, and there's something else. And we're never happy. And guess what? If you're never happy, you're not going to be able to do all these things that I'm telling you that you need to do because your people are not going to want to be like you. If you're a leader and you're always stressed and you're always dealing with bullshit and you always show it to everyone, no one wants to be like you and no one's going to want your job. Remember when I said earlier, you got to be a killer? You got to hide that shit. You got to be strong. You got to be resilient. You got to have grit. People have got to know they can count on you as their leader. When shit goes wrong, you're going to fucking fix it. You're going to help them. You're going to work through it. You're going to negotiate the best deals with suppliers and manufacturers. You're going to uh, beat the competition. You're going to do all these things. They got to get that from you. And if you're not that person, you're never going to grow and scale the way you want it. Now, you may have a lifestyle business, and that's okay. I'm talking specifically for people that want to advance dramatically and grow. So if you've got a lifestyle business and you're like, I'm just cool making whatever I'm making, then that's fine. But remember something, everything counts, nothing's neutral. There could be something going on in your lifestyle business that hasn't caught you yet. 
We got the five points? Where are we at on time? How, five minutes? I could go for another hour. Um, <clears throat> huh? Care, uh, pride. Pride. Yes. Communication, trust, care, collective responsibility, and pride. Five fingers. Fist. Values. I, I, you know, I've got five strategies in building and maintaining a team that, that could take forever. So I'm going to shortlist uh, some stuff quick uh, that may not seem as exciting, but at least you get the points. Um, the first one in, in the five strategies for building a team is vision building. I spoke about it earlier. Um, if you can't paint a vision to your team in a forum, in a team, in a meeting, in one-on-ones, if you can't get cast a vision of where we're going to your people, then why am I following you? See, we cast vision when we start and we talk about it a lot. And we're going to start our own company. It's going to be great. And we're going to build the biggest roofing company out there. And we do all this stuff, right? But then once we get sucked into the minutia of running a business, we stop talking about that stuff. And now we start talking about all the negative stuff and the problems and how we can't grow. And I just lost this guy and this happened. And these people stole this guy and we can't collect the money and we got cash issues and all this bullshit. These suppliers are ripping me off. I mean, uh, prices keep going up, and then there's COVID, then there's supply and demand, and we just get sucked into the daily operating of the business. You, as a strong leader, as a killer, need to always talk about vision regardless. All the time. Here's the cool part. The more you tell yourself, meaning you tell your people, but you're actually telling yourself every time you say it. Every time you say it, you're imprinting that into your own head. And the more you say it, the more you believe it. And the more often you do it, the more you believe it. The more you believe it, the more you change your actions. But if you're saying it only once in a blue moon for the sake of a meeting, just to try and get people to sell more, you're full of shit. You, as the strong killer leader, must believe that this is where you're going. And you're going to do everything you can to get there. And if you do that, I promise you, you will. You'll make the changes. We built the plane while we were flying. It wasn't perfect. We didn't have all our ducks in a row. We didn't have all our systems where they needed to be. I, if you leave here today, if I were to probably say like the most critical thing, you've got to talk about vision all the time. All the time. And every time you have a team meeting, that meeting should start with vision, and you should give them a lay of the land of the last meeting. Here's where we were, here's where we've come, here's what we've done, and here's where we're going. Here's what we learned, here's the mistakes we made, we changed this course, we're going here now. And we keep talking about vision all the time. I don't care if you've got two people, one person, ten people, a hundred people. They got to know they got a fearless leader that's going somewhere. And the business is going somewhere. Why? Because they want to be part of something greater than themselves. The minute they feel like that has changed, guess what happens? People start leaving. Because being part of something great is more important than money. You may not believe that. You may think your people are just greedy for money. But I'm telling you now, if you do it right and you can create that culture, that becomes more important than the money. The money is a byproduct of where they're going. Number two, understand what talent wants and work backwards. What does talent want? Think about this. Because this is going to help you in the way that you run your business, how you run your sales team. What does talent want? Think about it. Give me answers. Opportunity is one of them. If they don't feel high talent, if you get someone to come work for you, even if you've got a small team and you get a guy to come join you that's high talented from another industry, if he doesn't feel like there's growth and opportunity, he's not going to stay long. That's part of your vision casting and part of your daily actions and uh, your influence. What else? Recognition. recognition. When should you recognize people? All, all, really all the time. Give me an example of recognition. And this is where people, this is where people fail on recognition. Give me an example. How are you guys, you guys are in business, how are you recognizing your people? Well, we just had a company appreciation event on Wednesday, and I picked out a sales 
sales rep of the week. Yeah. Them, yeah. Uh, for them going over and beyond and, and growing, not just about the numbers that they hit, the person that they become when they start. I love it. I get it. Great. Everyone does that. Love it. We all love to have meetings and awards and all the rest of it. I love it. Keep doing it. You got to do that. That's not the recognition I'm looking for. Remember earlier I said everything counts. Nothing's neutral. You're either going forward or backwards. You see a guy in a corridor, it's an opportunity to do what? Thank you. Hey, I saw your production from yesterday. Great job. Bam. Recognition. If you know your numbers in your business, you have the opportunity to give recognition all the time. You see, we wait for these high performing things. And the problem with high performing events to give recognition is that we're actually only speaking to a very small portion of the business. So in reality, most of your business is not getting recognition. Because you're always rewarding top performers. But what if, remember, everything's a belief system like the players on the football team. Everything's a belief system. If you think they suck, they suck. You know the expression, if you think you're right, you're right. If you think you're wrong, you're wrong. But either way, you're right. If you treat them like they suck, guess what they'll do? Oblige. If you start treating them like they're winners and you give them recognition every time you get an opportunity, even in small things, in passing, in a phone call. For example, let's say you got to call a guy up because something was wrong or whatever it is, and it is a negative. How should that phone call start? with a positive. See, but we let our emotions get the best of us and we call them up and we want to shit them out because they did something stupid or they did something wrong or they didn't do it right. So why don't you, before you call them, go look at their data, talk to some people, see if you can find out something that they're doing right, something that they're doing good, and use that as an opportunity to start the phone call and then you just turn around and say, oh, hey, by the way, that thing, um, you take a look at that, man, that didn't, didn't look like you. I, I, as a matter of fact, when I saw that, I was shocked it was you. Can you get that fixed for me? Sure, yeah, no, I'll get it done. Guess what? That person gets off the phone motivated to fix it. But when you call them up and you shit them out, and uh, if you have multiple locations, we call that seagull management. You fly in, you shit on them, and you fly out. <clears throat> we, we, don't want, hey, we don't want any seagull management. Okay? Don't do that. Don't become that guy. Don't become that negative Nancy. It's an easy trap to fall into. Why? Because as a leader, as an owner, you got people pulling on you all day, every day, tugging on you, tugging on you. I want this. I want that. We need to change this. We need to change that. Then you got an investigator. Then you got an audit. And then there's this. Then there's that. And people are tugging on you. What did I say you have to be? A killer. And a killer, to me, that shit, water off a duck's back. You start showing that to your people, you're being weak. And you're not hurting you, you're hurting them. Because no one wants to follow a weak leader. And then I'm gonna wrap up uh, two more points. And then we good? Good? Okay. Stand alone versus left alone. This is a trap in our business. Stand alone versus left alone. We bring people in, we train them up, they start doing well, and we leave them alone. It doesn't matter how good people get in your business, you have to always add value. Otherwise you create silos in your business. You know what a silo is, right? It's an independent unit that's left alone and silos eventually break off. But if you always add value, regardless of how good they are and how long they've been with you, and you always look for ways to add value. For example, if you have leaders on your team and you talk to them every morning, what should some of your first questions be in the morning with them? <clears throat> Hey, how was your day yesterday? Who were you with? Oh, I was with Johnny, Paul, and Mary. How'd you add value? Not, hey, how are they doing? No, how did you add value? Not what are they doing? What are you doing? Because they are an extension of you. And my leaders are extensions of me. So what am I doing? And it starts with me. It starts with what am I doing? and it rolls downhill. So it's not like I'm the boss, what's everyone else doing? It's like, how did you add value today? 
And adding value doesn't just mean in your business. You can add value at home, in your personal relationship, uh, when you go on vacation with friends, I'm adding value by coming here. I'm always looking to add value. And when you incorporate adding value into your life, you're always looking for opportunities to praise. Don't leave people alone. They're going to leave you. And or, here's what's happening in the industry. I see it. You leave them alone. They're holding you hostage. When you make changes, what's your fix? Remember, you haven't added value for a while. Now you're making a structural change in the business. Now you feel hostage to them because they've been performing all this time. You haven't been adding value. This is all mental. You're trying to make a change. Guess what's happening? Motherfucker hasn't done anything for me in forever. I'm, I don't agree with this. So guess what business owners are doing? And I'm seeing it as we're looking at businesses. I'm dissecting businesses all the time because we're looking to buy them. And guess what I'm finding? This is a reality in the industry. Oh, uh, we'll, we'll make this change. We'll drop you over it. Oh, we'll increase your commission. Oh, we'll bring you in on a higher percentage. And everyone's on a different deal because you don't have consistency in the way that you run the business. And you haven't always added value and you used money to fix your problems. And then one day you wake up and you're like, this is a shit show. I got everyone and now like my net's low and like cost of materials is going up and shit and like my net's running at 12, 13% and like we're, the, we're, you know, heaven forbid at that point you hit a bump in the road where business slows down, your overhead's gonna eat you up. You're gonna have to close down, and open up another business. Because you didn't add value. You stopped adding value and you left them alone. Um, stand alone versus left alone. Talent acquisition. You're never full. You're always hiring. You're always being a great example. And you're always interviewing. Uh, quick guess. We've got 180 people. We've got over 400 in the group. Um, we don't run employment ads. We don't have a recruiting strategy. So how do we get our people? Huh? Absolutely. Take care of your people, look after them. They're gonna tell everyone they know to come work there. You don't need a strategy, it's a simple concept. It's like compounding interest. It will pay you back all the time if you just stay there and if you keep doing that. If you leave the money there, the compounded interest will grow. If you keep doing these things and your people count and you get them to make money, they'll keep bringing you people because that person they bring, you bring them in, you plug them into your system, you stay true to it, you get them to make money, guess what they do? They get you another person. And so it is actually never ending. If you think about it, it only slows down when you stop doing these things I'm telling you. Because some companies do get to a certain point and then they feel like they've tapped into everyone and they've tapped into everyone's friends and therefore they're not getting any more people. That's bullshit. Look inwards and say, what, what did we change? What have we moved away from that we were doing? So talent acquisition. And the last one. You incentivize Sorry? I do not. I do not. I know some companies do, and if it works for you, great. Service, who can finish the sentence? Service? Over sales. Obligates. Service obligates. When we service a customer and we go over the top and beyond, they feel obligated to help us when we ask. Service obligates. So if you make your process and everything that you do with your people awesome, and then you ask them for something. I even tell people when I meet them, I say, look, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna exceed the expectations of what we're talking about today. I'm gonna get your home back to way better than pre-loss condition. You're gonna be so amazed that you're gonna wanna refer me to everyone, right? But let's just pretend real quick that you're super amazed and like it's 200% better than you thought it was gonna be. Who would you refer me to? Can you write their names down? And they write them down. I say to them, I don't want you to give me their telephone number. I just want you to write their names down. And they're like, sure, because they're not giving you the telephone number. 
I depressurized it, right? See, most of us, hey, can you give me the name and number? They're like, no, I don't want to give away my friends' names and numbers. No, no, no. Just give me their name. After I exceed expectations, I'll ask you to fill in the number. Would that be okay? So guess what? If every single one of your reps do this, what does it force them to do? To deliver. Because they know they're not going to get numbers unless they exceed expectations. You actually just put yourself in a much higher position of accountability with every single customer to get referrals. See, but instead we do everything and then at the end, hey, do you have someone you can refer to me? You know, it's like in the health, it's like in the health club business, right? Anyone been in a health club business with a guest pass? You go in with a guest pass and they want to take your ID and then they want to take you on a tour and they want to do all these things, right? But a lot of people, what they do is they say, hey, can I work out first? I'll chat with you afterwards. And the sales guy says, sure. But the problem with that is once they've worked out, I could give you another example, but it'd be bad. Uh, once they've worked out and got what they wanted, they don't want the tour anymore. They're like, hey, can I get my ID? I'm in a rush. I got to go. You see, because if you do it once they've already got what they wanted, then it's too late. So if you ask them at the end for the referral, they already got what they wanted. No doubt there's some obligation there because you did great, but you want to contract them out early in the beginning and get them to write that list down. Make sense? Okay. Um, last one, protect the brand at all costs. The way I want you to think about it is the flag. If you see someone stumping on the American flag today, what would you do? I mean, it's a problem. It's a problem. Guns are coming out. You're becoming a killer, a literal killer. Not really, but you know what I mean. Maybe I am, just joking. Uh, but not really. It's for the camera. Uh, Seriously, think about it. You, this, this logo, like, like, I take this shit seriously. Like, it's an honor and a privilege to put it on every day and you need to do everything you can every single day you go to work where everything counts, nothing's neutral. And that logo, protecting the brand, the mission statement, everything about your business is critical. Those are my five points. I appreciate your time.